All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Pierce and uh, Spencer and Literati Books, and welcome, Morton. I'm poet and translator Michael Favala Goldman, and I am coming to you from Western Massachusetts. So we're going to speak tonight mostly about the uh, new translation, The Trouble with Happiness, which was just released yesterday in the United States. But we'll also say uh, a bit about the, um, the Copenhagen trilogy as well, Tova Dittnerson's memoirs from last year. And I hope to share a bit of poetry as well that reflects the themes in these books. In these books. I'm gonna start with an excerpt from the, the new translation, The Trouble with Happiness. This is from the story, The Cat. So the cat involves a married couple the wife has just returned from the hospital where she had a miscarriage. She's also fed and taken in a stray cat, which is not housebroken. The husband in this scene has just chased the cat out of the house, shut the windows so it couldn't jump back in while his wife is preparing dinner. I'm gonna read a few lines in the original Danish that Tove Dillerson wrote in 1952, and then I'll continue with the English excerpt. Lene lop mol køkken bord, betragtede han sin kone. Hun lod noget køk gå igen maskinen, og fangede det i hænderne, og ledte det ned i en skål, efter han som det kom krybende ud af alle de små huller. Some long lose on. From the cat. Leaning against the kitchen counter, he watched his wife. She was putting meat through the grinder and catching it in her hands and leading it into a bowl as it came creeping out of the little holes like long, bright worms. Where did the cat go? She didn't look up from her work. He shrugged. How should I know? She looked up quickly. You let it out, she said. Her voice trembled slightly with anger. Ah, you have cat on the brain, he said, attempting a laugh. She washed her hands and dried them carefully, finger by finger, with movements as if she were putting on gloves. Go get it she said calmly. His eyes darted askance. He wanted to say something. There was a clump stuck in his throat as if he were about to cry. What is the problem, he thought. It's almost like she hates me. With a helpless look, he walked past her and out of the kitchen. Kitty, he called outside. Here, Kitty. If the cat comes back, he thought, then everything will be fine. But it didn't come. He looked in the yard and all his anger about the cat was chased away by something overwhelming and unknown for which he didn't have the words. He searched between the trees in the snow covered grass. He was searching for a little cat which brought a load of trouble and no joy. It made no sense. He was a man who always had been led by reason and who had advanced step by step because of this. He never had urges to do meaningless things. He had married a pretty girl from a good family. In a few years, he would be a manager and then they might allow themselves to have a child. Gleda could stop working. Here, kitty, kitty, he was pleading for his life and he didn't know why. He was afraid. He was moving in unknown territory. He didn't recognize the woman standing in his kitchen anymore, demanding he return with a mangy, untrained animal. He wanted her the way she was before, when he could talk to her about everyday things. He would hold her in his arms and feel pride of ownership again. Maybe he could buy her with the cat. It was sitting in a corner of the shed hissing as he approached. Kitty, he whispered gently, don't be afraid. Come inside to your mama. Come on now. 
the cart, the cat darted between his legs and jumped in through the open kitchen door all by itself. She had it in her arms when he came in. Tears were falling on its fur. She kissed it on the head and on the paws and gave it long smacking kisses on the ears. He could see her body trembling. Gaeta, he said, frightened. Suddenly she let go of the creature as if she had been awoken from a deep sleep. And then she stared at her hands, which had just been caressing the cat so lovingly. She lifted her head and took a wobbly step toward her husband. Then she stopped and wiped her forehead with the back of her hand. Well, she said, I guess I'd better finish making dinner. Excellent, thank you, thank you, Michael. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for, for being here. Um, and uh, to the organizers for, for putting together this, um, this event. Um, Michael and I uh, did a similar event a um, little over a year ago, back in, in, in January 2021, uh, when the Copenhagen Trilogy was, was first published. And, uh, you know, we, we didn't know then uh, uh, just how um, successful uh, Tuba Dietlewsen um, uh, would, would, or how, how um, what the perception would be like. Um, you know, there had been some reviews uh, in the UK that certainly, you know, bode pretty well. Um, but um, it's it's quite remarkable to see um, the way that she has been, um, with the the reception of, of the Copenhagen trilogy and now of the the stories and her her novel The Faces, which has also uh, just been published. Um, so um, for, for, for anyone who, who um, is not quite familiar with, with Tuba Dietlewsen, uh, I'll just give a very quick, quick uh, a background, um, kind of a capsule biography of her. Um, so she was born in 1917 in, in, in Copenhagen, uh, in Vistabul, uh, which uh, back then was very working class, kind of a red light district. Um, and uh, she is one of the most uh, beloved uh, writers in Danish uh, literature. Um, she is a household name. Um, I, I grew up reading her in school. Uh, she's on my, my parents' bookshelves, my grandparents' bookshelves. Um, there are movies named after her poetry. Um, so she is uh, someone that, that everyone knows and everyone probably uh, reads as well. Um, and yet, and yet uh, somewhat oddly, she, or maybe because she was so popular, she has always been regarded with some suspicion by um, the, by the literary establishment in Denmark, especially during her life, um, when it was a stuffier, uh, much more male world. Um, she, um, she was regarded, she was kind of looked down upon somewhat by her, some of her colleagues. Um, they considered her to be, you know, not, uh, not experimental enough, not avant-garde enough, not political enough. Um, she didn't get uh, a lot of literary awards that many people felt that she deserved. Um, and so, um, so she's occupied a somewhat ambivalent um, place in, in Danish uh, literary history, um, but, but has um, experienced something of a resurgence, uh, especially since 2017, the, uh, the hundredth anniversary of her, of her birth, um, a, a new generation of young Danish writers have kind of reclaimed her um, and, and, um, and now with the Copenhagen trilogy, with the stories and with the faces being reissued, um, you know, she is at long last uh, experiencing and, and getting the, the, the broader international readership that, um, you know, that she absolutely deserves. So it's um, very gratifying to, to see and, and to be able to participate in, in some of that here. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, let's just jump right into it, Michael. Um, I think we could just start by, why don't you start by telling us uh, how you first discovered uh, Tuva Dietlewsen's uh, writing and what led you to uh, decide to translate first uh, the, the Copenhagen trilogy and then uh, these, uh, these stories. Yeah, just, uh, just to be clear, I didn't translate the entire Copenhagen trilogy. Right. I, I just translated the third book of the trilogy. And, and the way that I encountered that book was completely by chance. Um, when I, I've been reading Danish literature as a hobby for 30 years. And of course, it's hard to get Danish books over here. So every time I go, I'm, I'm, my wife is Danish. 
And I travel to Denmark pretty much annually and usually bring home 15 or 20 books so that I can read you know, until my next trip. And uh, so this was five, six years ago, uh, passing through the airport and browsing through the uh, bookstore, completely uh, not realizing that it was the centennial of Tova Ditlewson's uh, birth. And I had only read one book by her at that point. And many years ago, Bon Domen's Gale, Street of Childhood, uh, which is a, 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 you know, a classic in the, um, in the Danish literary canon. But, uh, but as I was looking at the bookshelves, I saw that they had a couple of her titles. And I picked up one called Gift, having no idea what it was, and just, and just brought it home and added it to my stack of reading. But as, when I finally got around to the book uh, and read it uh, that winter, I think it was, it was the end of the summer that I, that I was coming back home. And I remember when I got, this, when I got to the last, well, let me just say what it is. Um, so this, this is her, her third memoir and it chronicles her life from the ages of about 23 to 35. So as a, as a young woman, she, during those 12 years, she becomes, a famous and well-off, uh, um, very popular writer. She also has four marriages. Um, she also has two back alley abortions and a five year near fatal addiction to opioids. And as she exposes these dozen years of her life, when I remember putting down the book after reading the last page and saying to myself, I think I just read a masterpiece. And I don't, and it wasn't something that I thought about. It just kind of happened. I don't remember ever having that experience before reading a book, but I was like, this, there's something special here. And I immediately applied for a grant to do a, a sample translation, which is kind of a way to get, uh, to get a translation going. I got the grant, translated the 15 pages or whatever. And I, and I just felt so comfortable and, um, uh, and I felt like the translation was going so well that, and I, and I believed in it. And I decided to just translate the rest of the book on my own, on spec, to use my own time to translate it. Because I was so confident. I was like, this, this book is so brilliant. Of course, it's going to find a publisher. And it actually, um, over the next year, I was completely unable to find a publisher for it. I sent it to a dozen places. All I could get, I got a, um, an excerpt from it published in Apple Valley Review and that was it. And I was kind of reaching the end of my rope. I wrote to the Danish publisher, Gurdendale. And what I didn't know was that a couple of uh, English language publishers had approached the Danish Arts Foundation in Frankfurt hmm. that, that year looking for a Scandinavian female writer that they could promote if they could find a star. And they were told about Tove Ditlersen. They contacted Gurdendale. Gurdendale told me, I contacted those editors, sent them both my manuscripts, and they immediately both wanted it and engaged in a bidding war over it. Several weeks later, I found out that Penguin Classics was gonna put it out. So, Penguin Classics, they had this idea that here's a new translation of her third memoir. It, it had been around for 50 years, but it had never been translated. Now, she had, wrote, she had written two other memoirs, which were translated 35 years ago by Tina Nunnally. And Penguin thought, well, why don't we take the two older ones, attach, it, attach to it the new one, which is very dramatic and harrowing, and we'll market it as the Copenhagen Trilogy. The trilogy has never appeared in Danish in this way. This was a, a, a marketing technique that Penguin came up with, which I think was absolutely brilliant. And, um, and it turned out to be a hit. Um, you know, it made, New York Times called it one of the 10 best books of 2021. It sold over 35,000 copies in its first year. And, and not just that, you know, it, the books you know, were, when a book comes out in Danish, no matter how good it is, it can only be read by maybe 6 million people. Not that many people read Danish. And, but when it, and so publishers all over the world had no idea until it came out in English because almost every publisher has access to English. So when they started reading the trilogy in English, they were like, oh, we need this too. So the trilogy has been sold to 30 countries. 
And it's either out or coming out in Russian, in Czech, in Italian, in Spanish, in German, in Dutch. Um, uh, so what, when Atova's uh, centennial there in 2017, when these books were republished, something happened in Denmark. They called it Tova fever. And with the, um, with the translation of, her, of the trilogy in English, Tova fever has now spread all around the world. And, and it just boggles my mind that it came from, at least partly, from my picking up this book by chance, not even knowing what it was, from a bookstore on the way out of the airport. And it wasn't even Copenhagen Airport, right? You said it was Bilon. Bilon, yeah, small, a smaller airport, yeah. Small municipal airport in the middle of nowhere in, in yeah. on the peninsula. So that, that just, to me, makes it even funnier. Um, but you're right. I mean, the, so when, when the Copenhagen trilogy was first, uh, when I first realized it was being published over here, I thought to myself, I'm, is there a book here by Tobi Levison that I've never heard of? Um, um, because, you know, we know them in, in, um, in, in Denmark just as the three separate, we don't even really call them memoirs. Um, we call them Erentlingsbüge, uh, which is like works of recollection. Hmm. Uh, and as many readers and, and, and critics have remarked on, um, you know, they don't, they don't really read so much as, as memoirs. They very much read like, like novels in a sense. Hmm. Hmm. Um, but, um, um, Tell us about um, the uh, then the the translation of these stories. So that there, there are two volumes of stories in this book, um, and they are the two last uh, collections of short fiction that Tuva Dilos published um, in her life. Yeah, um, I just want to say I just want to say a word of gratitude before we continue, because um, you know, a, as you heard from my description of her third memoir, Tova Dilos read. I mean, um, lived a very turbulent life. Um, she had uh, she had mental illness at times. She had a very severe drug addiction. She had problems in her relationships, and yet she was born with this incredible talent. And and despite all the turbulence of her life, she was able to have the the dedication, the the discipline um, to uh, to basically make it a gift to the future. I mean, here we are, fifty years after her death reading her work and being inspired by it. So I'm grateful to her, but I'm also grateful to uh, the, the, the Danish uh, writers like Olga Aun and Dora Norse and Du Plambeck, these uh, especially female writers that took up Tova Ditlausen's cause and really started Tova Fever. And, and, and that is where you know, we've picked up where they left off. So I just want you know, to thank all of them um, for bringing us to this place Absolutely. and allowing us to be exposed to, to Tova Ditlaus in which otherwise, you know, she would still be a, um, you know, just a Danish writer. And now she's made it into world literature. Um, so uh, anyway, but the stories, the trouble with happiness um, is, a, is an interpretation of the original title, Den Ono Lüge, uh, which directly translated would be the evil happiness. <laughs> and um, so I've kind of massaged, interpreted that as, you know, what is, what is evil about happiness uh, in these stories is the way that, um, that, the that, that the people in relationship with one another strive to be happy and continually fall short. And happiness becomes almost like a myth or a curse. Um, that all they can see is wanting to make themselves happy and yet in some way avoid connecting with the person that is closest to them. And which makes the unhappiness almost you know, irretrievable or you know, un, um, uh, yeah. Uh, and there's, so there's this self-sabotage that happens uh, throughout the stories, which, which connects it to the trilogy because that also happened to Tova throughout her life. The reader can see how she's making these decisions about having affairs and uh, and taking drugs and things that we can see are really going to harm her. And yet, to her, to, for her, it seems like the only next step that she can see, and that and she's driven. Um, she has to do this for her own self determination and satisfaction. So, so there's this. So that's one of the connections is the trouble with happiness, and then then the other connection is the actual subject matter because, so we're reading her backwards. 
the the um the Copenhagen trilogy are some of the last books she wrote before she committed suicide. Um, and as we read, and, and that is you know just about her. That is her story, first person. This is me. This was I. This is what I did. I'm exposing myself and my life to you. But we're now reading her stories that she wrote in the 1950s and the 1960s. And one thing that she was criticized for during her life, as Morton alluded to, was that she mined her own experience for her writing. She wasn't uh, imagining you know, made up places or historical fiction. She was creating from her own personal experience. Now she was using that in a fictional way, but, but we can see when we read back in those stories, how she took episodes that show up later in the trilogy. And she expanded them and fictionalized them to, um, to give us a fuller, uh, a fuller experience of what it could be like. So where her abortion story in the trilogy is one long, is this one paragraph? In the, in the Trouble with Happiness, we follow a woman who's having an illegal abortion and we can feel the depth and the breadth of her experience in, in a deeper way. We also have throughout the Trouble with Happiness, we have marriages breaking up, uh, we have family splitting up, oftentimes the woman leaving the marriage, which happened to Tova four times. Um, uh, the children being caught in the middle. Of course, Tova had children as well. We have uh, husbands that are showing signs of, of instability or instability and mental illness in several of these stories. You know, her, her third husband obviously had a big mental problem. So, um, so this is, uh, the, the subject matter is totally related. Um, she was able to fictionalize it and expand it through the stories, and we get it really condensed and compact in the uh, in the trilogy. And I'll, yeah. I would love to read. A, I would love to read a little excerpt. But if you want to interject something first, no, 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 no. so one of the um, one of the scenes that we that we read in the trilogy is when she's fourteen and she's told that she has to leave school, so she has has to go get a job to help support the family because her parents are broke. And times are tough. Um, this is uh, during the depression. And um, uh, her parents, her, her mother says, this is the last pair of shoes we're gonna buy for you. And she's 14 years old. And that scene uh, is used earlier in this short story, The Little Shoes. In The Little Shoes, we meet a pretty well-off married middle-aged couple, Helene and Henlick. They have teenage children and they're getting ready in the morning. Um, tensions are rising between Helena and her husband and Helena and their housekeeper, the nanny, um, whose name is Hannah, who is playing music too loud, um, too loud for Helena's taste. So this is from The Little Shoes. She heard Hannah singing out in the kitchen Tell me why did you leave me? Please come back, please come back. From the dining room, Henrik was humming along and Helena felt betrayed and estranged. Something was going on in the house between everyone else around her, apart from her and right under her nose, something that was coming closer each day. She walked up to her bedroom and quickly got dressed. A button-down top and skirt. Her heart was pounding, but she took out her most uncomfortable, least clunky shoes. They were black and pointed, with a thin strap across the ankle and curved medium-high heels. Suddenly, she had a vision of her mother. They were in a shoe store, and Helena was getting new shoes. It was shortly before she took her first job. She was about 14. Her mother had said, this will be the last pair of shoes we buy for you. In that moment, she had seen herself through her parents' eyes as a consumer, an expense they would become free of. From that day forward, she had a troubled relationship with her mother, and she was proud of having established warmer, more lasting connections with her own children. But had she? Could you ever really know your children? She sat across from Henlick, observing his delicate, slightly worn face and the smoke-colored circles around his eyes. 
it occurred to her that she didn't know him at all. I found a book about sex in Morton's room, she said under her breath. Hannah lent it to him. I think those two fool around way too much. Henrik laughed and took a bite of bread. You're just jealous, he said. If she seduces him, it's only healthy. It's an old tradition that the sons of the house go to bed with the maid. His eyes took on a sudden snake-like expression as if he were evaluating how much he had wounded her. He hates me, she thought, dumbfounded. He's only a child, she mumbled unconvincingly. He's almost 16, he said flatly. Mothers would avoid a lot of grief if they realize their children are becoming adults, even though they're still in school. He might fall in love with her, she said, confused, going silent again, because it seemed as if the conversation was about something else. Henrik just shrugged his shoulders, stood up and pushed his chair under the table. She got up too and stepped toward him to follow him to the entry, like she used to do back when everything between them was fine. Perplexed, he looked down at her feet. Why are you wearing your dress shoes this morning? He asked. Then he left without waiting for an answer and without saying goodbye. Thank you, Michael. Um, one quick thing, um, if anyone has questions that come up uh, during this conversation, you can just put them in the, the, the Q&A chat um, and, and we'll, we'll leave time uh, you know, for, for questions at the very end. Um, um, Michael, I was curious, what, what was it like having, having, as you said, you know, we're, we're reading her backwards here from, from the, the, the trilogy uh, back through her, her last two story collections. Um, and I, as I was reading um, the, the story collections, um, I, I was curious about what it would have been like for you to, to do that back, so to speak. Um, and, and what was different for you from having translated the, the last volume um, of the uh, of the trilogy, and then you know what was what was it like to have to now uh, convey her fictional voice, which is, you know, it, it's the same it's the same world that we're discovering that that, that we recognize from um, from the trilogy, and it's you know it's the same largely the same setting. A lot of these stories are set in Vistable, um, and and for readers too, I, I wonder what it's like to now discover her her fictional voice, which especially early on is I think markedly different from from the the voice that we encounter in in the trilogy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say that the the voice in well, you know, this is like this is a complicated question, but um, it's a lot of a lot of pieces here. Um, let me first say that you know, just as no one asked me to translate Gift, uh, I just picked it up in the bookstore. No one asked me to translate the stories either. Um, after reading Gift and realizing how brilliant a writer she was, I started devouring her books. Now I, I've read about 15 of her books, um, uh, almost all her novels and short stories and essays. And just from all that, I the, 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 these two volumes of short stories is what rose to the top for me. When I'm reading a, um, uh, a book of, uh, I mean, any book, but especially a book in translation, what happens sometimes is that the page turns into a mirror somehow. And instead of just reading the author's words, I'm, I'm, I'm also reflecting on myself at the same time. Somehow I can see myself uh, in between the lines in the emotional charge. And when that happens, then I, I know I have found something special because it, it's, it's not just about their story, it's something more universal. And that's when I want to spread it around. And so that's what happened with the stories. I, I asked myself, you know, is there something else in her body of work that, um, that, that affects me like that? And this is, and this is what does. Um, so that's kind of where, where it came from. As far as the, you know, her writing style, uh, I feel that in the Copenhagen trilogy, because it is about her, she reaches just the, 
the epitome of vulnerability. She holds nothing back. It, it feels like I'm her confidant and she's whispering to me everything that she ha everything that happened in her life, all the trouble, all the mistakes, and she's not embarrassed about it. She's not sentimental about it. She's going to tell me exactly what happened without embellishing or leaving anything out. And this is just such an incredible vulnerability and just such, so much respect I have for her as a writer that she was able to do this and to craft it in, in such a way that it could be accessible to us 50 years later and still feel the power of it. It's just remarkable. In, in the stories, you asked about the difference of the stories, right? They're not about her anymore. So that, so there is, there is a, you know, that there is a, uh, a step down in that vulnerability. You know, what we have is the vulnerability, especially of the women in the stories. A lot of the women are pregnant or mothers or, you know, having a bad day or whatever it is, or, or paired with a, with a man who seems oblivious or is having problems of his own. And, uh, you know, with families uh, disintegrating and, and children stuck in the middle. I mean, there's just, there's a lot of vulnerability within the, within the scenes uh, that I feel like she portrays really well in her poetic voice that is so condensed and precise, um, but it's not about her anymore. So, so there is that slight shift in point of view. Um, one, one, one thing that um, readers who haven't yet got around to these stories yet should know is that I, I always regard D. Lewison as an absolute master of the opening sentence. Mm. There are just four I wanna read through very quickly just because I, I think they're sure. just yeah, I mean the the, the first one. Uh, I almost laughed when I read when I read the first sentence of the first story because it's just it tells you everything you need to know about what you're about to read, and it's a story called the Umbrella, and the the sentence goes: Helga had always unreasonably ex expected more from life than it could deliver. Um, and then a few other ones that that stood out to me from evening. Henna was only seven, but she had but she already possessed a great deal of formless anxiety. And there's from The Knife, uh, which is one of her most famous stories. Uh, he lay there intensely observing his sleeping wife as if she represented a mathematical problem which needed solving before he could move on to other things. And then my, my favorite from The Method, being married to an entire person was too much. Um, what, what, what's it like to, to you know, when you, when you see those sentences, I mean, it, it, you must feel some like a, a weight of, of um, you know, responsibility to kind of get them exactly right. I mean, they're almost, you know, they, they hit you like lines of poetry. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Well, that is my other, you know, my other occupation. Um, yeah. I've written three books of poetry. I have two more uh, coming out this year. And um, I teach poetry workshops twice a, twice a month. I've been doing that for uh, three years now, three, four years. Um, so poetry is definitely, you know, has this place in a central place in my life. Uh, Tova was also a poet first. Um, she wrote 11 books of poetry. And I think that's partly where her, her um, sensibility about the impact of a short line um, and to take out everything extraneous to take out everything that is explanation or sentimentality and just and just leave the author with the minimum so that the i mean sorry leave the reader with the minimum so that the reader can can become part of the story so that the reader can approach the story with their own experience it has not all been fleshed out but there's enough there so that the reader can identify with the emotional charge and then and then relate to it and become almost like a yeah like a, almost become a, a a ghost participant. And and you have you've written po poems that that are somewhat inspired by by your by your translation of Didlewson. Is that right? Um, there there are some. I would I uh, I would really love to read um, one more excerpt from the stories though. Absolutely. Uh, which which kind of gets to what I was talking about these vulnerable women with these controlling or oblivious men. Uh, and, and this is from the story, A Fine Business. And then I would love to read a, a couple of poems as well. Absolutely. So in a fine business, uh, a, a real estate agent is showing a young couple a house for sale. The wife's name is Greide. She's pregnant for the first time. And uh, the house is being sold. The, the woman is still in the house who's selling it. Her husband has recently left her. 
and she has three kids at home, two young children and a baby who needs to nurse. So after they go inside, the real estate agent and the, and the couple, the, the agent says uh, to the husband, shall we go upstairs? Go ahead and nurse, ma'am. I can take care of this. The woman hesitated as if she lacked confidence that he could take care of this to her satisfaction. Her daughter's clear voice suddenly filled the brief pause that followed. The girl was standing gripping a corner of her mother's dress. When it rains, it splashes down through the ceiling. The mother shook her dress free. Irritated, she blushed. Keep your mouth shut, she threatened. The child put her arm in front of her face as if she were expecting to get hit. The real estate agent was about to die of laughter. If you're not careful, your kids are gonna chase all the buyers away, he said. And then the joviality instantly disappeared from his face as if an invisible hand had erased it. Greta suddenly saw a gleam in his eye, which gave her an anxious feeling. She smiled at the girl who did not smile back. Oh, you must be sorry to be leaving your house, she said in a friendly voice. That's only natural. The real estate agent nodded and cut the tip off of a new cigar. Children don't know what's good for them. He looked knowingly at the mother as if he were waiting for her to agree with him. The husband wrinkled his brow. Is it true it leaks when it rains? he asked in an interrogatory tone. The woman blushed slowly all the way down her throat like a child caught in a lie. She opened her mouth to respond, but the real estate agent beat her to it. Nonsense, he said flatly. Excellent, thank you, Michael. Um, so, so yeah, we would love to, to hear these poems um, and then, uh, I think after that we can probably uh, I can you know read some of the questions. I think there are two questions in here in the chat so far, um, but but please um, back to you. Um. Yeah, so I'll read three three poems. This first the first poem is a little is a, is it about the trans? I mean, it's about the creative process, which the translation process also is. That as a translator, I am tasked with embodying the voice of someone else that I am not, um, my, my task is not to write the book as I read it. My task is to write the book as if Tova was writing it if she wrote in English. And so I need to weigh every phrase. Uh, it's not a word for word substitution. It's finding the meaning of each phrase and finding how to reach that same emotional charge through whatever words in English they are not necessarily the ones that I find in, in a Danish English dictionary. Um, so there's an art, there's a craft to that. And the book, it's a slow process that gets funneled through not just my mind, but also my body. I have to feel what's going on in these scenes so I can mimic that same charge in English. And, uh, and in that process, I can't help but being changed. This poem, the title is Creative. I got some on me. I was just dabbling in a new form of expression. I didn't protect my work area properly, not to mention myself. I was having such a good time, I got some on me. So what? My endeavor grew. So many angles, spin offs. So now I'm covered with it. We're inseparable. It is me. So that, um, yeah, that was from my first book, uh, Who Has Time for This? This next poem is from uh, my recent book, Small Sovereign. This one speaks to, I think, both the cat the husband and wife and the cat and the husband and wife in the little shoes. And that, uh, that feeling of impasse that the, uh, 
the communication is impossible. This is called emotion-based demands. You should be a certain way. I should be a certain way. And you should know what it is. And I should know what it is. Without my ever telling you, without your ever telling me, you should have a breakthrough. I should have a breakthrough and fill my emptiness and fill your emptiness. And then I'll be happy. And then you'll be happy. And then um, actually to finish up, instead of reading another one of my poems, I like to read a poem by the national poet of Denmark who died a few years ago, Benny Anderson. This is from the collection, Something to Live Up To. And this is his poem, Happiness. I'll, I'll read the first couple lines in Danish and then I'll read my translation in English. Lurken. Der er noget særligt ved lurken. Man kan blive helt glad, når man møder den, men også beklemt, står stille lidt, lister sig så varsomt frem, som i et minefelt. Happiness. There's something special about happiness. You can be really glad when you feel it, but also anxious. You freeze for a second then slowly step forward cautiously, like in a minefield. And every time you put a foot down without being blown up, you either forget to enjoy your happiness or you're upset over not knowing how long it will last. So when adversity finally makes its appearance, it's a relief, like you've made it to safety again. It's a shame because there's something special about happiness that you don't otherwise come across. Maybe that's the problem. We don't know it well enough. Should learn more about it. I think it's a matter of training. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. That, that was fantastic um, and, and great idea to end with. Uh, um, a, a poem about happiness, uh, very appropriate to, uh, to to the discussion and certainly to Tobi Dietlewsen. Um, so, uh, you know, we have two questions here um, in, in the chat. Uh, the first one is from uh, Susan Lippman, uh, who asks, uh, Michael, uh, what was it that you experienced when you first read Dependency that <laughs> made you call it a classic? So you could talk about long time so <laughs> yeah 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 there's a lot there I'll, I'll try and be brief um so uh part of it was are things that i already mentioned um her writing style which is very dense and clipped and spare and blunt and unapologetic uh and vulnerable at the same time i mean to have all that it, you know in a writer's voice is just sublime that despite her dramatic events I found there was some there was this kind of a joy just to read writing that was this brilliant. Um, and then there's also the content of her dramatic uh, of her dramatic life, both the uh, uh, both the uh, the marriages, the relationships, the depend codependency there, the uh, the uh, her, her illegal abortions, which you know continually you know come back to me that that you know uh, you know. Um, that that is still an issue, you know, for us today in the United States, and uh, and then her addiction, uh, her five-year near-fatal uh, addiction to opioids. And last year we had a record number of fatal overdoses in the United States. I mean, this is something that is well, it's not just her. You know, this is this is universal what she's putting before us in the most, you know, in the most brilliant writing that that I could imagine. So it's the subject matter. It's also that it's also the way that it touched me personally, because I was on her side. I love her sense of humor and her confidence in being able to expose herself. 
but I also saw her self-sabotaging behavior. And it was really hard to witness as a reader and as a translator. And when she made it to the end of her addiction, she's down to 65 pounds. And, um, and she calls her psychiatrist because she realizes that she's dying. And she gets picked up by an ambulance to be taken to rehab. At that moment, I'm, I, I remember calling, you know, I was translating the book. And even though I knew what was happening, I, I was just so moved that uh, she was, you know, had a chance at redemption. And I remember calling my wife into the living room from the kitchen to tell her that Tova, you know, even though she was at death's door, she was going to rehab. And in that moment, I realized that when I turned the page, she was going to be going through withdrawal. And that that was some of the most harrowing, frightening reading I had ever done. And that now I realized that she was going to be going through it again. And that in some way I was going to be going through it with her line by line. And I just broke down sobbing in my wife's arms. I just couldn't, I couldn't bear it uh, from what we, I didn't want to see her suffer. And I could just, I, I was just overwhelmed by the, the magnitude of the event. And I realized that I had to be kind to myself in that moment. And I decided that same day that I was gonna put the book down and just stop the translation for two weeks is what I decided. And during that time, I worked to pro just process what I'd been through and why it had affected me so deeply. And I, one of the things I realized was that um, as a society, even today, we have a lot of ways that we encourage people to go to excess, um, whether it's with you know, drugs or um, consumption in many, many ways, right? Whether it's with you know, food or, or drinking or gambling or work or whatever, you name your, name your dependency. And I realized that it wasn't just her issue, that it is, it is part of the human experience, that everyone is, is vulnerable to dependency and that I am too, and that I have blind spots as well. And that it was about time that I dropped my judgmental thinking about people who have dependencies because, uh, because it is something that we all have and that I, that I could be more supportive and that as a society, we could be more supportive as well. Um, so it's all of that, you know, there's so much in that book that I felt was a, a gift of, uh, as again, a gift of Tova to me and, and, and to the future. So related to that, there's a question here uh, from Greg. He says, uh, do you view the trials and upheavals uh, in, in, in Tilda's life, addiction, broken families, mental health crises, as elemental or essential to her works? Or do you view her art as being deeper than those stories? Uh, so, you know, deeper, less deep, whatever. You know, what, what she had was an incredible talent. And um, you know, she never went to writer's college, right? She dropped out at middle school. And yet she had a dream of becoming a writer. She had it in her. She knew she had it in her. And she had this dream. You know, she married a publisher who was more than twice her age because she knew that he could get her first, help her get her first book published. I mean, she would, she, you know, she put herself um, at the mercy of her talent. And then she put her life at the mercy of her talent, that everything that she experienced, she subjected to her pen, whether you know, first fictionalized and later in her autobiography. So there, if she did what she had to do to express herself through her art. And it sustained her at least to a point until, um, until life you know, somehow lost, meaning, lost its meaning. Yeah. Um... Lauren asks, um, I'm wondering how much uh, Toba experimented over the course of her career. Uh, can you speak to any significant shifts in her writing style over the years from your reading? So I think you, you mentioned that you had read 15 of her, her books now or something like that. Yeah, yeah I lost track, but. So um, uh, she has a, you know, a hyper realist way of writing, right? Uh, as someone said, I think it was in the London Times uh, just recently, one of the reviewers said, um, Ditlowson can conjure 
an entire world in just a few words. I feel like that is so true and that there's a gift. I mean, she obviously has a gift to invite the reader in to a new reality every five pages, right? Um, uh, sh there, there is some experimental fiction in even in the, the happy, uh, in the trouble with happiness. I, I especially think about um, the method where it gets quite uh, expressionistic where she's uh, commenting on the different parts of her husband, her husband's face and each one of them has a different uh, period of time because she can't relate to his entire being. And, and so it becomes, yeah, uh, kind of very ex expressionistic there. Uh, in the faces as well, wow. Uh, when she's writing about what it feels like to go through a mental crisis, that is, in, that is just incredible. There's a, you know, it's, it's non-linear. Uh, it's like dreamscapes that she's creating that are super powerful, that someone, you know, even someone who is not going through like has a sense of what that could be like. And it's similar to when she, when she went through withdrawal, right? How she describes the withdrawal experience that it really gets under your skin, even though we've, you know, you may never have experienced that. We, we get it through her, but not, not in an easy, nice way, right? It's in a, it's in a more nonlinear expressionistic way. So, um, so there is that. I also must say that her poetry went through, uh, uh, which I know we're not talking about her poetry much tonight, but that is another evolution, how she started very hyper-traditional, where all of her poems were with meter and rhyme and, and followed a very, very strict st uh, structure. But then much later in her career, uh, she, she moved to uh, free verse and ultra short lines and it's really stripped down, really bare poetry that we also see reflected in uh, the Copenhagen trilogy. And it's worth mentioning too that she wrote in a variety of genres uh, throughout her oh, yeah. career. Um, and she wrote children's books as well. Uh, she wrote uh, an advice column for a women's magazine uh, for a number of years. Um, for 20 years, for 20 years. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there, you know, there, there is a lot of, um, of experimentation with certainly with different genres as, as well. And then, of course, as, as you mentioned earlier, essay collections uh, and, yeah. and so forth. Um, how are we doing on time, uh, Pierce? Well, these questions are so good. I, I wonder if we could get to just a couple more of them. Do you guys mind? No, not at all. They're remarkable. Thank you, everyone, for your great questions. Uh, so the, Mia asks um, what the name was of the song in the little shoes, whether it's a song uh, in Danish is well known. It's not. No, no, I, I just made up the I just made up the melody. I have no idea what that song is. <laughs> okay, great. Um, and then a question here um, about uh, whether Danish language has gender specific elements that you learn through these translations. Of um, of a female author. I I, uh, <clears throat> I need I need help with that. I, I guess I think I, I think the question. Is, I mean, what what <coughs> if there were, was anything about uh, either the the Danish language or or Tove uh writing in uh, in particular that um, that was specific to to her gender or that oh, okay. Uh, mm -hmm as a man translating her, if that had any. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'm, you know, obviously I am not a woman and uh, I haven't experienced some of the same things that, that Tova went through, uh, you know, trying to be a mother and foster a career at the same time. <clears throat> and also, you know, just growing up at that, you know, in, in that time, you know, as you already mentioned, of being looked down upon by the, the male dominated literary elite or literary establishment in Denmark as being a, uh, uh, a women, a, you know, a woman's writer, not being a serious uh, literary writer. Um, uh, and, and also throughout the, you know, throughout the trouble with happiness, all, all these women in these in vulnerable positions. And, you know, all I can do is, um, you know, is try and be as flexible as I can, you know, like, I, I try and adopt her voice and let the and let her words and her phrases lead me into the uh, into the emotion that she's 
that she's creating between the words and between the lines. Um, and, uh, you know, and that's really, you know, that's my, that, that's my job. I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't know, you know, if there are, you know, if maybe there are times that I did, you know, that I didn't quite get it right. I don't know. Um, but uh, I've also, you know, been approached by many other women writers since then who have read my translation and have wanted me to work on their books as well. So, um, so I feel that that's, that that's validating. Um, and, you know, there has been some debate in the, uh, you know, in the, in the translation world about who should be translating what. And, um, uh, and I, you know, I don't have the answer to that. You know, should, should women only, you know, should only, should women writers only be translated by other women? I don't know. Um, but, you know, my, my mission, you know, is, is that when I find a book that feels like world literature, and that if I can do whatever I can to liberate it from the small language center that Danish is, then I, I'm, I want to step in and do that. I feel like Tova did not just write for women, that she wrote for me too. And uh, this is the, like the least I can do to help, uh, to help serve her and to help, to help serve the cause of her writing. Mm. Um, we have another question here, uh, which is, what is your favorite book of Tova's? Uh, favorite, I mean, you know, it, it has to be gift, you know, dependency, yeah. um, because both because of the writing and the impact it had on me personally, and also just the satisfaction, like the, you know, the best, the best of literature has this transformative power of softening this protective shell that we have around our hearts so that we can have more compassion for people around us and for ourselves. And I feel like that's what, that's what she's done. And, uh, and that's what made it, you know, that's sort of like my mission as a translator, what, anything I can do to increase compassion and, uh, and understanding in the world through literature, that's what I'm, you know, that's what I'm here for. Um, and then the, the final question here, is there a biography in the works? Um, Michael and I cor corresponded briefly about this. Um, I, I think neither of us are aware of any new biography in the, in the works. I mean, there are certainly some in Danish already. Um, yeah. um, and obviously she, she led a very uh, turbulent and very dramatic, very public life. Um, so there is obviously lots of material there, um, but, uh, but not aware of any, any uh, new, new biography. All right. Um, thank you, everyone. I think that's probably all the time we have. It's been great. Thank you, Martin, for this conversation. Thank you, Michael. Thanks to all the bookstores for hosting. Thank you so much for hosting us and for all of you for, for attending. Uh, you know, we hope that you buy uh, the trouble with, with happiness and the faces. Um, and, you know, if you haven't read the, the Copenhagen trilogy, uh, that's also obviously a great place to start. Um, thank you, everyone. I could just mention that my I have a website with all of my books and essays about this stuff and you know blogs and and also links to publications where you can read more of her work uh, and more of my work and it's just my name michaelfavalagoldman.com if you go there you can find all that and spencer just put the link and thank you spencer thank you thank, thank you everyone you. Thank you both so much. This has been incredible. Um, I, I could listen to hours more. Um, your passion, Michael, and and the way that you have um, companioned this book and and now multiple books to us is it's really a, it is a service to world literature and to us as readers. Thank you, and Morton, it's such a joy to have you always, and uh, thank you all for joining us. I, I hope you saw some of the lovely messages in the chat. Um, just a lot of appreciation for the two of you and for this work. Right. No, we're, we're very grateful. Thank you so much for having us. Wonderful. And with that, I will say good night. Good night, all.